Today I would like us to imagine that we're looking through a telescope. So a telescope does what? You look through the lens of a telescope and it brings that which is far away close and then it also brings it into sharper focus. So this might mix metaphors a little bit, but we want to travel back in time because we're going to travel back to the Passover, the very first Passover. That's what the next chapter in Exodus deals with, Exodus chapter 12. And then we'll be looking through the lens of the Passover into the future to the cross. And the lens of the Passover is going to bring the cross near and it's going to bring it into clear focus. As I mentioned, chapter 12 of Exodus relates two things about the Passover. It relates the first event of the Passover. So the Passover was a historical event. But chapter 12 also describes the way that God instituted the yearly commemoration of the Passover to the Jewish people. And as one digs into this historical account, the more you're going to find of value. There's no way we can cover it all just today. But we want to begin from the perspective that the entire Exodus history and all the events point to the greater Exodus to come at the cross of Jesus. Passover is the central event to the Jewish Exodus as the cross is the central event to the greater Exodus. And specifically, as we talk about this lens of the Passover, we're going to be looking through that lens using four nouns. The lamb, the blood, the salvation, and the feast. Those four nouns or those four lenses we will look through toward the cross to see how they bring the cross near and into focus. I'm going to be reading from Exodus chapter 12, the first 30 verses. It's a long passage. But it's an important passage. And I want to encourage you to do whatever you need to do in order to stay awake as I read. Okay? So you can stand up. If you need to ask accountability from the person sitting next to you, accountability in the form of a sharp elbow, you know, feel free to do that. For this period and this period only during this reading, we are going to assume that if your eyes are closed, you are not praying. Okay, we're going to assume that this time. We can get away with that in church often, can't we? Where it's like, I'm just praying. No. Um, so Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. I want to pause there just for a moment. I want us to hear the new beginning. God saying to Moses and Aaron, and by extension to the people of Israel, this is brand new. This is the first month. This is the first day. It starts now. We've been leading up to this tenth and final plague, the plague on the firstborn. And it's going to be devastating. And it's going to be in deeply saddening and mournful for some and liberating for others. And because of that, God says, mark it, mark it, mark it. This is the first month, a new beginning. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roasted over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. 
with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days, you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly and another one on the seventh day. Do no work at all on these days, except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. For seven days, no yeast is to be found in your houses. And whoever eats anything with yeast in it must be cut off from the community of Israel, whether he is an alien or native born. Eat nothing made with yeast. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop. Dip it into the blood in the basin and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. The first lens through which we want to look is the lens of the lamb. Passover begins with the choosing of a lamb, a year old male lamb or goat clean and without defect, and the people are specifically told to choose the lamb and then care for it. There's an implied intimacy and gentleness. And yet we know that the ultimate end of that lamb is slaughter. And upon its slaughter, the lamb will provide two things for the people who cared for it. It will provide blood and it will provide flesh. The blood will bring salvation and the flesh will bring nourishment. Now, as we look through that lens using the lamb, we ask, to whom or to what was that innocent lamb pointing? In the Gospel of John, right near the beginning, in the first chapter, John 1, verse 29, John the Baptist is in the wilderness. He's near the Jordan River. He's been preaching and he's been baptizing. And he looks up and he sees Jesus coming toward him. And he says to the people that are around him, listening to him, he says, behold, in other words, see, look, behold, the Lamb of God 
who takes away the sin of the world. So right there at the beginning of John's gospel, that correlation, that connection between the Passover lamb and Jesus is made. The lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, the Apostle Paul goes even one step further in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 to 8, because there he refers to Christ not only as the Lamb of God, but as the Passover Lamb. So he says, Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. The Lamb of Exodus is an image of Jesus, the Lamb of God, whose death on the cross will provide blood and flesh. His blood will bring salvation and his flesh will bring soul nourishment for those who believe in him. The second lens is the blood. You know, you you can't read this passage and not notice how much emphasis is placed on blood in the Passover. The lamb was to be slaughtered and some of its blood was to be painted on the top and then on the sides of the doorway to each house. And God says that the blood is going to be a sign. It's going to be a sign for his people and by extension a sign to him. And he says specifically, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And that's the source of the English word, pass over. The destroyer, the angel of death, will pass over the houses. He will skip the houses that are marked with blood. And the firstborn of each of those houses will be spared. Now, that's a pretty gruesome thing to do, isn't it? And I would suggest that if someday you were to leave your house and you were to look over and your neighbor was standing there with a basin of blood and some herbs and he was painting the blood onto this, you would be a little bit disturbed. You would be a little bit concerned. And you would seriously think about moving. It's supposed to be shocking. And we miss that. I think we miss the, the, the arresting nature of the blood. We've become very conversant with it. We talk about it a lot in church. But it was intended to be shocking. And I've mentioned this before, so this isn't anything new to you. But I remember seeing the shocking nature of the concept of blood through the eyes of both my son and my nephew, who are close to the same age. And for each of them, it was at different times, but for each of them who had been raised in church, who never remember not going to church, who might, may as well have been born into the church building, and they've heard particularly the communion celebration over and over and over and over again. And yet for both of them, when they were about five years old, You know, they're sitting there in that five-year-old torpor of church that these five-year-olds sometimes feel. And both of them are like... And I remember Micah turned to me and he's like, that's blood? Speaking of communion. And as God is instituting this with the Israelites and he's telling them what to do, I am certain that they were like, wait, blood? You want us to take blood and paint it onto our houses? At the very least, that is weird. At the very worst, that is deeply disturbing. And yet, God prescribes it to the Israelites. He requires it of them. Why? How does the lens of blood bring the cross into sharp focus? When Pastor Bill celebrates communion, he often quotes Hebrews 9.22. And most of you are familiar with that verse, even if you don't know the reference. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Do we take that verse seriously? Because a profound statement is being made there. And and the statement is that sin has to be paid for. Forgiveness doesn't mean that the consequence of sin is simply removed. No, forgiveness means that somebody other than the guilty party pays for the sin. Someone's got to pay. 
Someone has to pay for sin. The wages of sin, the result of sin is death, says Paul in Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. Everyone's going to get that wage. And just to be clear, the Bible referring to death, it does talk about a physical death, but it's referring to complete separation from God. That's called spiritual death. Eternal separation from God. That's what sin brings about. Eternal and complete separation from the presence and sustenance of God. That's chilling and terrifying. And the result of sin is that separation. Sin is serious. Sin is deathly serious. It demands a high price, the highest price possible. And all of us are guilty. At the Passover, a lamb died. And the blood of that lamb was placed on the doorframe. And let's not miss this. There's the shape of the cross implied there on the top and on the sides. That lamb sacrifice points to the deeper, greater, more profound exodus when Jesus, the Son of God, the great Passover lamb, would die, shedding his blood to make forgiveness possible. Your forgiveness, my forgiveness, was bought at a very high price. Jesus paid it instead of us. The blood of a lamb painted in the shape of a cross on the door frames of ancient Israel transforms into the blood of Jesus painted on the hearts of those who believe in him. 1 John 1.7 says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And listen to this last phrase. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Going back to Hebrews real quickly, chapter 9, verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death? so that we may serve the living God. Do you see what that lens of blood brings into focus about the cross? The high price that was paid, but not by me and not by you. The high price that was paid by Jesus and his blood brings salvation. And that brings us to our third lens, which is the lens of salvation itself. How did salvation come about for the firstborn children of the Israelites? It came through faith, followed by obedience. There's nothing magical about the blood of lambs. There wasn't anything magical about the blood of lambs then. There isn't anything magical about the blood of lambs now. But in this specific circumstance, it was the manner in which God ordained that Israel would be saved. This next point is so important for us to grasp. Israel was not saved because they were Jews. I want you to hear that. It was not their Jewishness that saved them. What happened in this situation was not based on ethnicity. The salvation was based on the blood alone. That's what God said. When I see the blood, I will pass over. Not when I see your ethnicity or I see your wealth or I see your effort or your position or your virtue. It is only the blood. And to that, remember the hundred-year-old hymn, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Only by the blood of Jesus is there salvation. And we need to grasp that. Because in this context, we see this consistent dichotomy between the Egyptians and the Jews. And therefore, we might think, because the Jews are God's chosen people, that he saves them because they're Jews. But that's not the case. It's the blood that he sees. 
And that points to the truth of his blood in the future that he sees. His blood which covers those who believe in him. Now, how did the blood come to be on the doors? How did, they, how did it end up on the doorframe? It ended up on the doorframe through obedience. And I want us to see this relationship between faith followed by obedience and action. Because what if, what if the head of an Israelite household had said, you know, yeah, I believe. I believe that what God said is true. I believe that the destroyer, the angel of death, is going to come by tonight. And I believe that he is going to kill the firstborn in every house unless there is blood on the door. And then he does nothing. He doesn't slaughter the lamb. He doesn't put the blood on the doorposts. And what happens? And so I want us to understand that true faith, true belief in God, if we believe that God is who he says he is and that he does what he says he does, it will be lived out in obedience. Faith expressed through obedience. And I want to make something clear. Jesus died to save people, to offer his blood as a sacrifice. His death so we could be forgiven and not die. And that great passage from Ephesians 2 affirms unequivocally that we are saved by grace, through faith, and this not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Okay, many of you, or some of you, for some of you this may be new, Maybe you're new to church. Maybe you're new to the scripture, new to this concept. Maybe you don't even know what it means to be saved. I want you to hear something right now. This is very, very important. You cannot earn salvation. It's impossible. You cannot be good enough to make God happy with you. You could never sacrifice enough or expend enough effort to deserve to be saved. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 is saying. You've been saved by grace through faith. It is the gift of God. See, you can't earn a gift. A gift by its very nature is a gift. It's something that's given out of the, the joy in the heart of the giver. You can't earn it. If you earn something, that's a salary. And when you work really, really hard, and you work overtime, and you work harder than even your boss wants you to, and then you receive the salary after that, do you go back to your boss and say, thank you so much, thank you, thank you for paying me. Oh, I never deserved that, thank you. No, you're like, where's my overtime? You know? I earned it. So it's a gift. It is a gift. And that's what grace means. Grace is something that is given that we don't deserve. And God saves us by grace. And then it says through faith. So faith is our response to grace. God gives us grace and faith is our response. Faith is to believe. It's to accept that Jesus really did die and that his blood, his sacrifice, his death takes the place of my death so that I can be restored in relationship with God rather than separated from him. But we have to understand that there is a logical, sequential result to faith. And once we're saved by faith or by grace through faith, the natural outplay of that is a transformed life in obedience. So we see with the Israelites, they had to believe that what God said was true about the blood and the destroyer and salvation. And then they had to, so they had to believe it. They received it by faith. And then they took the next step in obedience to actually put the blood on the door frames. We believe that what God says and what he has done is real and true. Then after believing, we follow through on our faith by obeying him, by surrendering our lives to him in obedience. We are not our own. We have been bought at the very high price of Jesus' blood. And we respond to that price, that sacrifice, with faith followed by obedience. Don't be deceived into separating faith 
and obedience. Because one should naturally follow the other. The final lens through which we look this morning is the lens of the feast or the celebration. The institution of the yearly memorial that God requires of Israel. And he's very detailed in his requirements, isn't he? He tells them exactly when it's supposed to take place, how long it's supposed to take place, what they're supposed to eat during it, what they're not supposed to eat during it, that there should be no yeast involved for that whole seven days, that they're not supposed to work during it. Now that would be a challenge. And God says that this is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. So it's supposed to be repeated annually. A lasting ordinance. And he says, he uses it specifically to describe how they're supposed to talk to their children about it. When your child, children ask, Why do, what, 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 what is this to you? Why are we doing this? It's as though God's saying, I want the children to ask because then you have an opportunity to talk to them. Just like when Micah says to me, that's blood about the communion table. That's a wide open door for me to talk to him about the truth of Jesus. Right? And I can imagine that for those young Jewish children at this time, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how it was prepared, but today I I wouldn't get super excited about a feast of bitter herbs, you know. And I mean, and that's a part of it. I think even for the children, for them to say, "Why, "Why are we doing this?" And what God intends is that the reality of this celebration would sink into and penetrate and be permanently present in the hearts and minds of his people, even for those in the future generations that did not participate or didn't, they weren't eyewitnesses to the original event. Four different times in chapter 12, God emphasizes that this is supposed to be a lasting, repetitive ordinance for the generation to come and he wants the reality of this miraculous deliverance to root itself in the history and the culture and the consciousness of the Hebrew people there is great power in repetition and ritual there really is and I know that in the church there's been a reaction against that and I understand that from time to time because a ritual can become empty when it is divorced from faith Okay, when, when, when faith is removed from a ritual, then it does become meaningless and empty. But God is instituting here for the Israelites a ritual, and there is power in ritual. Let me tell you something else. Ritual and repetition, you may not believe that, but advertisers believe it, and advertisers do a better job of this many times than we in the church do. Let me prove this to you. I had to go back and figure out when I had heard this. It was from 1982, And it's still a mantra in my mind. Coke is it, the one that never lets you down. Coke is it, the most refreshing taste around. Coke is it. Why is that in my mind? Why is it still there 30 years later? Because it was repeated over and over and over again. And what God is about here in the Passover is providing a way for future generations to, in a very real way, remember and participate in the event itself, even though they weren't alive at the time. And as we look through the Passover lens of the celebration, what current day celebration and meal comes into focus? The feast of the communion table of the Lord. The Passover feast of ancient Israel has been transformed by God into the feast of his table. And just as God told the Israelites to celebrate Passover as a lasting memorial for generations to come, so he has said to us in his word, as often as you do this, communion, as often as you do this, Do so in remembrance of me. The ancient Israelites ate the flesh of the lamb with bitter herbs commemorating their salvation from Egypt. Today, God has given us a new meal with new elements. 
And it is a meal, have you noticed? There's no meat present. Why is that? Because the sacrifice was made centuries ago. And it's complete. Jesus as the Passover lamb is effectual for all time. Back into history and on into eternity. There's no more need for another sacrifice. And yet, Jesus wants his church to remember and enact and soberly celebrate his sacrifice on the cross. He wants us to never, ever forget. He wants his church to repeatedly be reminded of and blessed by his body and blood, which were broken and shed so that we could be forgiven. Uh, My younger son, Micah, in his school that he goes to, they have actual Bible classes. And um, every week uh, in class, he and his class members, classmates are supposed to memorize one or two Bible verses. And his teacher has done something which has, I think has been excellent. What he does is he attaches certain motions that relate to every word or phrase in the verse that the the class is learning. So as they learn the words, they're actually acting it out at the same time. And listen, some of these are really silly. You know, some of these actions are really silly. But you know what? When When the child is actually physically enacting it, it gets it into their minds. It gets it there. And this has helped Micah so much in memorizing these. And when we're practicing these verses at home, you know, he'll stand up and he's doing the motions, you know, put on, you know, whatever, the peace of God and, you know, all this kind of stuff. You know, he's, he's got it. And there's actually a theological godly foundation for something like that. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16, Paul, who, yes, he wrote more of the New Testament than anyone else, but other than Christ himself who speaks of it, Paul is the one who addresses communion more than any other writer. And in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, he says this, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? So even as Micah and his classmates are actually participating physically in the verse, God is saying, I want you for generations to come, when you receive the cup of thanksgiving, when you receive the loaf that is broken, it's a participation in my body and blood. And as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me because when you do it, you are proclaiming my death until I come again. And for those of you, which is all of us, who were not eyewitnesses to the cross, he invites us to participate in this celebration and this feast. He doesn't tell us how often we're supposed to do it. My personal opinion is as often as possible. But he hasn't, you know, for the Israelites in Passover, it was once a year. He doesn't give us that prescription in the New Testament. He just says, as often as you do it, whenever you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Now, to those of you for whom this might all be new, I hope that you've gotten at least a beginning understanding of what it means when we talk about being saved. We, we, we all need to be saved from that penalty of sin, which is complete separation from God. And you're invited to that salvation. Jesus extends his death in place of yours, his blood in place of yours. And he says, if you will receive that and accept that by faith, you will be saved. You'll be restored. You'll be restored to relationship with God. So practically, what does that look like? That looks like humbly admitting that we're sinners. Remember, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. Well, forgiveness comes because there's been some kind of transgression, some kind of sin. We're all sinners. And we have to acknowledge that. We acknowledge that before God. I am a sinner. I've fallen short of the mark. I am not perfect. I can never be perfect no matter how hard I try. And I accept by faith the sacrifice that Jesus made for me on the cross. 
I accept that. His blood makes possible your salvation and your forgiveness. And friends, today we celebrate the new ritual, the new meal, the new memorial. Passover led to the exodus of the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt. The cross leads to the exodus of the children of God from slavery to sin and self and death. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. His body and his blood have been given for our redemption and our salvation. And each time we do this, we remember his death. We reaffirm our salvation, deliverance, and redemption bought by the sacrifice on the cross. Let us keep and celebrate this new feast that Jesus himself has ordained for us. Amen. And those who will be serving, I invite you to come forward now. And as they come to prepare the table, I give you a few minutes to reflect and to consider the sacrifice of Christ made for you.